Hello, classy folks. Welcome to episode two of Ancient Medicine, in which we're going to get down and dirty with some human remains. But before we do that, uh, we've got to talk about ethics, because when we're looking at people's bones, right, um, and soft tissue, if we're very lucky, we're dealing with human beings. And human beings are still human beings, even if they've been dead for 2,000 years. Um, why do I have to frame this this way? Well, we've got to talk about the sordid history of human remains study in um, Europe and mainstream European science. To give you an idea of what I mean by that, this is a, a painting of a mummy unwrapping party, which was a thing that used to happen in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, it was quite fashionable for a while, where a bunch of upper class European folks, um, the British are prime offenders here, but it's kind of equal opportunity, uh, European colonialist behavior here, um, would acquire a mummy in Egypt while abroad, um, not, mind you, paying any of the local Egyptian authorities. Of course, at that point, uh, Egypt was British possession, so uh, peak colonialism behavior here. Invite all of their friends around and unwrap the remains as a kind of entertainment spectacle. Now, this is problematic from a number of angles, and I am going to start from the least horrifying and kind of move on to the most. This destroys knowledge. The process of unwrapping mummified remains um, would literally rip apart the evidence of the remains. The wrappings were sometimes cut through, thrown out, burned. Um, if the mummified skin stuck to the wrappings, it could pull that off. So it physically destroyed the body. And this was not done in any kind of systematic way either. So like they weren't taking good notes. There wasn't any record of what was being destroyed. So we could go back and figure it out. So like this is bad science. And you'll notice I said least objectionable. This is the thing I'm least exercised about, even as a historian and scientist, because as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a human being. And when we're talking about Egyptian mummies, it's a violation of um, uh, incomprehensible depth. Because when this human being died, they and their relatives believed that it was necessary for the physical remains to be preserved so that the soul would be able to travel back and forth to the afterlife. And without those physical remains, the soul would be houseless. So when they went to the trouble of mummifying their dead relatives, they weren't just doing it for funsies and kicks. They were doing it because somebody they loved, their father, their brother, their child, had died. And they wanted to make sure that that person they had lost had a good afterlife. And so they expended a huge amount of time and effort in preparing the remains, wrapping the remains, tucking little things into the bandages to help protect their dead loved one. And then they carefully put them into a tomb covered in coffins so that the soul would always know where to find them. So when a bunch of folks take that body, bring it to Britain, and systematically destroy it for the entertainment of a crowd, what we're doing is we are flying in the face of that person's religious beliefs. And we are, if that person's beliefs are correct, divorcing their soul from its place in the afterlife. And that is freaking unacceptable frankly. And that's one major reason why the study of human remains still is something where we have um, some ways to go. We've become a lot better about this, especially as we've developed non-invasive techniques for looking at mummified remains. We can now use MRI machines so we can see what's going on with the body without destroying the body. Um, these bodies are now protected and held in Egypt by an Egyptian government that is respectful to the experiences of um, those folks. Although, you know, I go back and forth on whether 
a museum storage space counts as an alternative tomb? I think it can, though. Um, ancient Egyptians, when they felt a body's safety was in question, would often move it to a safe location, which is why we have Ramses II, by the way. So somebody's remains managed to survive. I think he'd be, like, super stoked that we still get to look at his face. If you've met Ramses II, you'll understand. Uh, this is not even the worst case scenario for mummies in the uh, 1718 and 1900s. They were exported in mass to Britain where they were ground up and made into fertilizer or used as medicine. Mummium was um, a crushed mummy powder that was used to treat all kinds of diseases. So um, medical cannibalism was a thing in medicine much more recently than you might think. Uh, so, the way that I relate to the remains that we're going to be looking at here, um, and kind of my guiding principle for the course in general, is to remember that we're talking about human beings, and we have to keep in mind the circumstances of their burial, their death, what their beliefs were, how we can best balance our respect for their beliefs, along with a curiosity about their lives. With that, though, I think often as historians, we don't talk enough about empathy. We tend to think that empathy gets in the way of the science. I would, however, contend that empathy is one of our sharpest and best tools for getting to understand people that are distant from us in time and space and language and culture and religious beliefs. Empathy allows us to connect that, to that part of another human being that is like us. But empathy isn't just about like recognizing like. Empathy is about honoring that which we recognize while taking delight and that which is different. Sometimes delight, sometimes I'm a little... Uh, the point here is... While... Looking at human remains is morbidly fascinating, and I will admit I take some morbid fascination in this topic. Um, we can do better, and the first step to doing better as historians, especially historians of the human body and the experience of weakness, disability, disease, infirmity, is to start from a place of empathy. Empathy isn't the enemy. Empathy is the key. So keeping that in mind, let's talk about what we can tell from human remains, what we can't tell from human remains, and the sorts of things that inform the way that we've put together a better understanding of the texts we're going to read in this class. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do like a full-on physical anthropology section of this course, but it is a really important part of what we as medical historians do, and I just want to give you a taste of what that looks like. So here we go. A bucket list of stuff we can tell from looking at the remains, and an outline for the shape of this lecture too. The first thing we should always be looking at is the archaeological context and the positioning. So the way that we find the body is really important for understanding the situation in which this person got to be in the ground that we find them in. And to give you an example of what we can tell from how we find a body, I've given you two pictures of some very interesting burial contexts that have sparked some interesting questions. So at this point, I'm going to invite you to pause this and to kind of scribble down some of your first thoughts about what's going on in the picture up top with the archaeologist and then what you think is going on in the picture below. I'll wait. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. Now, some information that will help with the first picture, picture at the top. This was found outside the walls of a Roman fortified town in Britain. This was a Roman garrison in occupied territory. And the body dates to a period where the Roman military was using Britain as a base and where there was still direct colonialist control over the locals. 
the body was found as you see it here um there are only bone remains here so we can't tell for sure if the wrists were bound but this is not a regular burial position the body was also found in the ditch just outside the fortified military base so hands tied behind the back body in the ditch the limbs are splayed so this wasn't the kind of position that's typical of a respectful burial and all of this taken together suggests to us that this body was likely a local um, somebody from roman britain who was executed and then put into the ditch outside the roman fortification walls so likely we're looking at one of the many 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 victims of roman occupation in britain what we're looking at here is an executed criminal well, I mean criminal uh yeah i am not siding with the romans on this one this is shitty human behavior don't do this um I don't know if we have done isotope analysis on the bones. There are things we can do to figure out if this person was born in Britain. More about that later though, we'll return to this. So the people on the bottom, you'll notice they're facing each other. They're kind of looking each other in the eyes. Their, their arms are intertwined. So this is how they were found. This was a position that's part of a burial context so the other stuff in this grave is suggestive of a respectful burial so these are people who were put into a grave not by their enemies but by their community so that's the first stop the second interesting thing about these bones is that when we went to sex the skeletons more about sexing the skeletons later not as disgusting as it sounds the pelvises and the skulls are both typical of male-bodied people. So these are most likely two men, assuming they're cis, and they're buried looking each other in the face, embracing each other. Um, they've got a nickname, actually. They're the, the lovers. And they were found in Italy. And there's a lot of debate about what's going on with these folks. Are they brothers? are they married you know are we looking at a same-sex couple the grave doesn't give us that information so this is all speculative but it's sweet like this means that these two folks had a relationship they died together somehow i don't know if we found any uh trauma markers on the bones um so we don't know, you know did they die in battle did they both have the same disease uh, they must have died at about the same time though because both of the bodies are together and this means that not only are we looking at people who most likely loved each other in life but their community saw them and recognized their love and knew that they'd want to be together in death too which is just oh these guys so <laughs> that's a wholesome body to kind of help to recover from poor poor ditch person so things we can tell from bones we can get a rough sense of age at death more about that in a minute we can have a decent idea of sex although that can be complicated too more about that coming up we can look at patterns on the bones to determine what their occupation may have been in life. Um, the more you use muscles, the deeper grooves it leaves in the bones. And this often gives us a lot of information about, you know, do they use their legs a lot, their arms a lot? How can we tell? We'll see. Stress markers are another thing. So this isn't just the stress of injury and wear and tear, although that's part of stress markers, but we can also tell how healthy the person was generally speaking we can see if disease was causing nutritional deficiencies depending on the character of the bones we can tell if 
they recovered from periods of disease and starvation and so on. And that's really important information. It lets us know about that person's experience of illness, generally speaking, and their quality of life. We can also sometimes tell if not cause of death, at least likely cause of death or disease process, processes ongoing at time of death. Now, most of the time, this has to be a disease that leaves markers on the bone. And that's a very small percentage of diseases. I mean, if you think about it, like it's, um, you know, name 10 diseases, and then very few of them are going to show specific changes in the bone. But there are enough of them that we can tell some things, and we'll be looking at some examples of this. DNA is a new thing we've been able to do, and this has given us some really incredible information that pairs well with isotope analysis. I'm going to jump my list a little bit. Isotope analysis tells us what kind of minerals did the body have access to when building the bones. And these are like radioactive isotopes um, like strontium, chromium, um, a couple other ones, oh, different kinds of carbon, depending on if you're eating fish or wheat or, you know, other things like that. Uh, they can also tell us uh, geographical region. So the food that you eat comes from the soil that you live on and the soil isotopes where you live get into the food and then get into your bones. And this is really important because DNA tells us about your ancestry. So DNA can tell us that um, some of your ancestors came from the Levant, which is like uh, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, that kind of coastal area um, of the Middle East that's nearing on, the, verging on the Mediterranean. Or it can tell us that your ancestry is from Egypt, uh, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Italy, um, Mesopotamia, Persia. We can get pretty specific markers with DNA about um, where your family lines came from, especially mitochondrial DNA gives us great evidence, at least for your maternal line. However, what DNA can't tell us is where did you grow up? What part of the society were you in? And that's where isotopes come from. So isotopes can tell us that when we find someone with African ancestry in London, as we have done quite a few actually, then we look at the isotopes and it'll tell us that this person was born in Britain, grew up in Britain, had their children in Britain and then died in Britain. Uh, I should have mentioned, we can sometimes tell if somebody has given birth to a child, but uh, that's a little iffy. We can kind of guess, but unless we find like fetal remains, we're sort of guessing, but we can take an educated guess on that. So the thing that DNA and isotope analysis has made us really reconsider and rewrite about the greater Greek and Roman world is the way we imagine people from that world looking. And um, what I'm getting at here is browner than Hollywood thinks, especially when we get to uh, the Roman period, because when the Romans occupied a territory, they would use recruits from one side of the empire and send them to the other side of the empire, which is why we find so many African ancestry folks living in Britain, which is kind of cool. So already this is a wealthy source of information that has huge ramifications all over the field of ancient studies. It really opens the doors up a little bit to um, a more inclusive understanding of what's going on in the Mediterranean that is also more accurate. And accuracy is always a thing we should be aiming for. Cool. One of the other things that we look for in a burial context is whether we're dealing with someone who is elite or non-elite. We can't always judge this, of course. Um, thinking back to our poor fellow in the ditch, we don't know if this is a local chieftain's kid or a local chieftain. Is this, uh, you know, a local villager? Like, we can't tell because it's a violent burial context. 
But if somebody is buried in a container, like the urns we're looking at here, or if someone is buried in a grave with grave goods, that can tell us about socioeconomic status. If somebody's bones show good nutrition and good general health, that often suggests to us that we're dealing with someone who hasn't had a lot of food insecurity. Now, we should be careful because disease processes happen to everybody. Rich people aren't immune from getting sick. And where is this uh, more true than in Rome, which has a huge endemic malaria problem? Now, wealthy people could avoid Rome during peak malaria season and often did, but endemic malaria was a thing and rich people get sick too. It's a great leveler in some respects. But the remains, the burial context, all of this can give us an idea of what kinds of questions to ask of the evidence we're seeing. Um, we should be careful, though, because we're dealing with a society that has slavery as an institutionalized part of itself. And when an enslaved person dies living inside a household that is wealthy, often you'll see this mixture of high status burial, but signs of heavy labor on the bones. So that's something that we are always suspicious of and thinking about and looking for. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave that there. It'll come up again. Okay, so let's talk age. We're looking at a set of craniums. So this is the, the top part of your skull. So right here is mine. When I'm looking at these, I often wonder, like, what would my bones look like if somebody were looking at them later? Not like uh, this kid at the top here. Um, this is this is a baby. You can tell somebody's under the age of one because there aren't cranial sutures yet. So when you're born, you have an area of your skull that's cartilaginous. It's made out of cartilage. This is the soft spot. If you've ever seen a newborn baby, you may have noticed like they cry and their head bulges and it's really distressing. That's the fontanelle. And this is left flexible so that when you're pushing the baby out of your pelvis, the, the cranium can kind of squish and it's not going to hurt the brain. You want that to be really flexible. And then if there's any swelling after the birth process, the bones aren't going to trap the brain and you're not going to get damaged that way. At least not unless things go horribly wrong. But infant skulls are flexible, but they're also very soft, so try not to drop your baby on them too much, or at all, which is surprisingly difficult advice to enforce. My son was very wiggly. He's fine. He's fine. Uh, right. So over time, your bone tissue grows into that space that's covered by cartilage, and eventually those plates meet in sutures like these. Now this happens by about your first birthday, no later than your second birthday, but really first birthday, your skull is all bone by then. These sutures persist into your middle age. So as you get to be, um, you're going to see the sutures very, very clearly in a younger person. So a teenager, you're going to see much more clear sutures than we see in this middle skull here. If you look where the, the number five is, especially here, do you see how the bone is smoothed out a little bit? It's already started to join. That starts happening in your 20s. And it continues very gradually into your 40s. So by the time you get to your 40s and 50s and really 50s, you get a skull that looks like this one right here, where you can kind of see where the sutures used to be, but it's very smooth. The bone has grown together. The plates no longer move along each other. And this continues into your, you know, as long as you get to live and have a skull, and when you're dead, it stops because your bone isn't alive anymore. Um, forgive me if you've heard this before. Um, bio people, you'll know this. Non-bio people, though. Bone 
yeah, it's hard, yeah, it's durable, but it's living tissue and it's squishy on the inside. So you've got this outer shell of this hard calcium rich bony tissue with some cartilage and um, you know, other components to it. It's why like when you set a break, your bone will heal back together. It's slower growing tissue than your other tissues, but I mean, it's still healing tissue. Um, the inside has the medulla, that's the marrow of your bone, and that's what produces new blood cells. It's a very important part of our health, and if something goes wrong with that, um, you're probably going to be anemic really fast. Don't eat radium, by the way. I say for no particular reason. If you want to know why you shouldn't eat radium, though, um, you can do no better than Kate Moore's Radium Girls. Just Google Radium Girls if you want to see what happens when your boss makes you eat radium for a living. Yeah, that's why we have OSHA. So, so don't eat radium or phosphorus. Your jaw will fall off. I hope that's useful to you. All right, so let's talk about age in young people's skeletons. Pre-adults have a couple of processes going on that let, help us get really granular about their age, although we have to be cautious too, because if there are disruptions in your food security, then your body is going to slow the growth process in order to conserve resources. So you're going to hit these milestones a little bit later and that's going to be a knock-on effect. When we're looking at pre-modern people's remains, we're in a world that does not have vaccines. Vaccines are a major game changer. Um, I need not tell anyone who's been alive for the past uh, year, but nonetheless, it, it bears mentioning. A lot of the people that you know wouldn't be here if it weren't for vaccines. Without vaccines, your childhood is a series of illnesses one after the other, so much so that pre-modern doctors had a list of classic childhood diseases that you kind of like go through like a quest line in the worst video game ever. And when you were done and you'd survived, good job you. But these major illnesses meant that people were shorter on average. There's also a high parasite load in antiquity because of hygiene issues and a lack of antiparasitical medications that are effective enough to do a good job of controlling parasitic infections. It's not that they didn't have options, but the options aren't great and aren't safe and sort of trippy. Google Wormwood, <laughs> and you'll see what I mean. More about that when we talk pharmacy. Okay, so the places that we look for when we're judging uh, whether somebody's still growing, how fast they're growing, how old they are, are the growth plates. Pre-adults have open areas in their bones where the part of the bone that joins up to the joints isn't connected by hard tissue to the shaft of the bone itself. So between the epiphysis, right, the, the growth, or sorry, um, the epiphysis and the metaphysis, so the two ends of the bone, is this area of soft and still growing tissues called the fusus or the growth plate. This is from the same word that gives us physical. It's the growth area on a bone. It's from the Greek word for nature or growth. And you can tell that this is a pre-adult skeleton at least wrist joint, because you can see both of the growth plates haven't been fused. When you're done growing, that growth plate will fuse. It'll turn into hard bone tissue, and you'll end up with just one whole radius and ulna. I have. I feel like a show off doing this, but yay, no growth plates. Thank you, modern medicine. Another thing we can look at are teeth eruptions. When you're born, your baby teeth are still in the bone of your skull. So they'll be down in your mandible, they'll be up here. And then in the first few years of life, they'll begin erupting. So with very young children, we can tell how old they are with 
pretty reliable accuracy because they have a secure food source. They either have breast milk from their mother, their wet nurse, and uh, I should point out that not all babies were able to breastfeed in antiquity, so bottle feeding was also a thing. They'd use animal milk. So uh, not everybody can breastfeed and not every baby will figure out how, but there were options in antiquity as well as today, but the main go-to was community breastfeeding. Uh, ancient people would think it's really weird that modern people expect just the baby's mother to be the only source of milk for the baby. Um, this was something that you'd either share in a community or, and here's where it gets a little bit less warm and fuzzy, you would enslave somebody and force them to breastfeed your child. Yeah. <sighs> so up at the top, you can see where you have baby teeth, and baby teeth are smaller than grown-up teeth. This um, mandible is really interesting, though, because the adult teeth were in the process of erupting as the baby teeth were falling out. So this is a child likely around the age of seven-ish. It's about the time when your teeth start falling out, and since it's it's not the front seas, so you've got adult teeth erupting in the front, and you've still got a little baby molar over here, and then you've got here and here a couple of baby molars that are in the process of coming out. So likely this is an older child. If I had to like put me up a wall and guess, I'd say like 9, 10. Now, at this point, the baby's no longer breastfeeding, so food insecurity is going to play a role in teeth eruption, but it's not as big a role as we see in growth. Um, your adult teeth are forming in the bone tissue of your jaw as your, your baby teeth are in place. So when you're born, your baby teeth are still in the process of erupting. Your grown-up teeth because they're still forming their enamel down in the bone of your jaw, if you don't get enough nutrition, there are some changes that are created in the enamel. So let's have a look at that. Okay. So I'm going to start with the teeth. If you look at this person's teeth, and I took this off of the skull of someone I met when I was at the Wiener Laboratory in Athens. So this is someone I've met. Hi. Nice to see you again. If you look at the enamel on the teeth, do you see these horizontal lines that are about at the same level across all of the teeth? Kind of like looking at a the strata in sandstone or something. Those are places where the body, while it was forming the tooth, it couldn't get enough mineral content to form the enamel, likely because the person was sick and the body needed all of those materials to fight off the illness and repair damage, or because the person was malnourished and there wasn't enough stuff to make the teeth altogether. Now, there are other signs of disease process here, too. If you look at the gum line, do you see how the bone here is thickened and kind of bubbly looking? This likely means that um, the gums were experiencing an infection around the time of death. If you look down here, there's a little bit of plaque, which is we do find in ancient bones. However, No, I don't think there's really a however here. It's not coming from refined sugars. So the kind of chronic cavity damage that we see today because we have access to refined sugars, not so much a thing in the Mediterranean. While they could get sugar cane, it was an import item from India and very expensive. So expensive that they used it in fancy toothpaste, which is just the worst idea ever, but they're, it's not the only bad idea we're gonna see this semester. However, soft grains and porridges could also form these sugar plaques. Um, plaque happens when it, your body attempts to stabilize um, bacterial growth in your mouth by turning it hard and kind of rock-like, 
and that's your body trying to make it inert so it's not going to attack your teeth. And here, despite the hairs lines on the teeth, this person has most of their teeth. Uh, they're not missing a lot of them. Um, there isn't even a whole lot of wear. And this person was young, but this isn't the worst dental situation I've ever seen. They just seem to have had a, a rough childhood and some food insecurity issues, which is uh, not great. Could be worse, though. All right, so that is linear enamel hypoplasia. So the second term goes with the tooth picture. So let's talk now about Harris lines. So Harris lines are on bones, a lot like what we're seeing on the teeth here. When a person is growing and they either are very sick or they're not getting nutrition, not only their teeth growth is stunted, but also their bone growth. And kind of like rings on a tree, the pace of growth will slow at the growth plate. And those times where the growth plate was stalled will create thickening in the bone tissue that you can see when you x-ray the bone. And these chatter marks coming up to the growth plate are places where this child's growth was arrested because of illness or lack of food or both. And as you can see, this person's growth plates never fused, so this kid didn't make it, which is, um, which is sad. It's poor parents. Okay, so let's talk about sex, asterisk. Um, the asterisk is coming on the next slide. We can make a very good educated guess about sex when we're looking at skeletons. Um, keep in mind that we mean two different things by sex and gender when we're talking about human beings. So sex is the um, biological category. So this is your chromosome makeup, the structure of your bones, the way that um, your body is put together, the kinds of reproductive organs you have. So that's what we mean when we're talking about sex. And that is not the same thing as gender. Gender is the social landscape and construct of how you relate to um, your gender identity. So this is um, how you feel on the inside. You know, do you feel more male, more female, neither, nor? That's gender. When we're looking at sex, there are some things we can tell just by looking at the bones that are suggestive, although not completely diagnostic of which biological sex somebody falls into. So the first place we look is at the skull because on average, and this you have to adjust for population too, because you have different skull shapes and body types in different populations in different parts of the world. But on average, as compared to the population a folk a person comes from, if you have um, a typical male body, you're going to have heavier musculature attaching to your skull bones, which is going to produce stronger bone structures underneath to support those heavier jaw muscles. Uh, you're also going to get more spreading in the jawbone, so you end up getting, it's often described as a more square jawline, and you're also going to get a heavier thickness of bone at the brow ridge here when compared to a more typical female skull where you see a slimmer line along the jaw, lighter bone ridges over the eyes, um, less pronounced cheekbones because you're not connecting quite so large jaw muscles onto this. So in the presence of testosterone, you get more bone growth and more pulling on the skull, and that's what gives you the kinds of shapes that you see that vary by sex. And you can see these two skulls from the profile to kind of get an idea of what this looks like from the side. The more reliable place to look is the pelvis. 
because female bodied people's pelvis needs to be able to um, unhinge in order to squeeze a baby out. Not fun, don't recommend, although the baby is nice. If you look on this pelvis, um, here pointing at the one closer to us, um, and you look like down into this space here, so don't look so much at the ankle of the hip bones, but you'll notice the coccyx, the tailbone is tucked down into um, the space between the pelvic girdle. And there's a very strong attachment point here at the front. The front of your pelvis isn't completely bone. There's a strong ligament that holds that together. This ligament relaxes if you're giving birth through your pelvis. Uh, your body releases hormones that make all your ligaments relax. Uh, similarly, there are ligaments that hold this part of your bone, the, the sacrum, to these bones, the, the ilium. That's the iliosacral joint. So if you look at the pelvis here in the back, you'll notice that the tailbone isn't tucked as much. So there's more space there. There is indeed headroom so that you can squeeze, squeeze your baby out of there if you need to. Uh, one of the things that we look at when we try to see if somebody has given birth is we look here at this area called the pubic synthesis. So that's where this ligament connects the front of the pelvis. And this ligament, because it stretches during the process of birth um, quite drastically, it'll sometimes leave a chatter mark on the bone where that ligament is pulled away from the bone tissue a little bit and the bone has scarred up to compensate. So if we see that on a pelvis, it's highly suggestive that someone has given birth. Now we used to think that you could count the number of chatter marks and count the number of babies. We no longer think the data supports that, so we can't get that specific. But if we see a lot of activity in that region, it is suggestive of multiple births. And if we see nothing there, that doesn't necessarily mean the person hasn't had children, but it is very suggestive that that's the case. I told you there's an asterisk because sex is not a binary. We find people who are intersex in all human populations, and the ancient world is no exception. In fact, because of the nutritional landscape, uh, especially large-scale anemias, this often produces people who are intersex at a higher rate. Now, not only is this people who are born intersex, so intersex means uh, a number of things. It's a catch-all term for people who don't fit the, uh, the defaults of either male or female. So the distribution of sex in a population isn't like this and this, where you have a male and a female. Rather, what we see are ah, a poorly drawn set of peaks. So in this area between the two very poorly drawn peaks, there are people who are mostly male-bodied or mostly female-bodied, and then in the middle there are people who have characteristics of both. So this includes folks who have um, chromosome makeups that aren't XX or XY. Sometimes you get XXX, which I guess would be all the way over here, or you can have XYY, which is like over here. Um, or I don't know, maybe that's over here. Uh, here is where my science knowledge is going to be a little weak and maybe you guys can correct me a bit. But this also has, um, this isn't just about your X chromosome versus your Y chromosome, but also about what hormones your body is producing when and what hormones your body is exposed to while it's developing in the uterus. So if you get exposure to less testosterone, that's going to cause changes in your body. If you're a male-bodied person who produces more testosterone, you're going to have some female body characteristics. There are also people born with um, either both genitalia or genitalia that 
is ambiguous or um, genitalia that hasn't fully developed, one of the most common is undescended testicles. So your testicles begin their life inside of your body and they drop down into the scrotum at some point in the late stages of pregnancy or in the first year of life usually. Today, we surgically correct if your testicles haven't dropped, but in antiquity, they couldn't do that. So these people would be considered intersex by ancient logic, and ancient people totally had this as a category. Um, they didn't call it intersex. When it happened to somebody who was mainly male-bodied, they called it intersex, or sorry, no, they called it um, eunuch, which can be slightly confusing because eunuch is also a term for people whose bodies have been altered by removing their testicles. And this is what we're looking at here. So this is an intersex person from antiquity. They most likely would have called themselves a eunuch, though. So this was found at Kesna, Egypt, and it's a Ptolemaic area bur era burial. And we can tell that this is someone who either had a body that didn't naturally produce a lot of testosterone or somebody who had had their testicles um, either surgically removed or otherwise compromised. Uh, if you want to know details about how that works, ask me on a live session. You'll notice that the growth plates aren't fused properly. If you look very closely here and here. And then the patella are also deviated to the side. Now, some of that is just a natural result of the burial. But then also, if you look at the, the phalanges, they're very long and the bones in general are long. So this person was very, very tall and would have, uh, there's some other changes that the torso too is a little sunken, which is typical of someone who is male bodied, but doesn't have testosterone exposure during child or adolescence rather. So without testosterone and also not estrogen, you become much, much taller, but also you tend to put on a lot of weight. Your rib cage doesn't develop as much. Your musculature doesn't get as heavy. So you have characteristics that are feminine on your skeleton as well as masculine. And this person's bur burial was also put at an angle opposite to other people in this burial place. So you'll notice that this person is laying this way, other people were buried this way, which suggests that this person met a special category in life as well. So all of these things taken together suggest to me that this person was a eunuch. And also because this was a high status burial, likely this was a eunuch with some kind of a function within an elite household. So, all of this is to say that when we're looking at ancient bones, we have to make sure that we keep intersex people in our uh, mental background as we're figuring out, you know, what to call them. And then again, what to call them, of course, is complicated by the fact that sex is not gender. So we also look at grave goods they're buried with, context of their burial. And we find people who also do seem to have been trans in the ancient world. So, you know, people are people. And there's a wide and beautiful variety of us out there. Okay, so let's talk about our jobs in the ancient world. Occupational markers. As I mentioned, if you use a muscle heavily, it will tend to... Um, need a stronger attachment point in the bone and this is what i mean by bone changes or muscular defects this will create a deep groove where that muscle and tendon have attached deeper into the bone tissue in order to resist and heal from injury and this you get from lifting very heavy loads so Either this person is a bodybuilder or likely they're doing heavy labor that's much too difficult for them. So either we're looking at a low status person, um, a freeborn status, or we're looking at an enslaved person with the marks of forced labor on their bone. Here we have a set of patellae. So these are kneecaps. They're off the same person. And you can see polishing here we'll talk about polishing a bit later that's something that happens as part of an arthritic change 
but on the top here, the bone is worn down into the soft medulla of the bone. Uh, when you see this honeycomb kind of shape, that's not the bone's natural surface, that's the interior of the bone. So this person has spent a long time kneeling and kneeling forward on the kneecaps. And this is something you can try at home. Try kneeling until the bottom surface of your kneecap is grinding into the floor to kind of feel what this person felt to create this kind of change. What we think is going on here is somebody is kneeling while grinding grain, which you often do on a, a hand mill where you push the rock back and forth and back and forth. So they're rocking on that edge of the patella. Another thing this could be from is uh, you know, any kind of kneeling work, um, maybe a floor loom, which we do see in the ancient world in Egypt, although upright looms are more common, so probably this isn't weaving likely, excuse me, we're looking at a lifetime of grain grinding. So I mentioned that kind of fluffy bone texture when we were looking at that jaw with the um, enamel lines. The name for that kind of bone change where you see this sort of bubbly texture to the bone is called parotic hyperostosis. So the porotic is because the bone has pores in it, it has all these open holes, and hyper means too much. Ostosis is bone swelling. So too much bone swelling that's kind of fluffy looking. This is a change that we see in bones very frequently associated with anemia, especially if we see it like we do on this child's skull here. Do you see how the entire surface of the skull is covered with this kind of coral shaped growth? This happens when the body doesn't have enough iron and it tries to pull iron out of the bone stores in order to get the hemoglobin back up to a more iron rich state. When we see it in modern patients, we'll take x-rays and it looks like the hair is standing on its end on the x-ray. So sometimes you'll hear it called the hair standing on end sign, but that's parotic hyperostosis associated with anemia. But we see it also in people who have a severe illness that's lasting for more than a week or two. So this we'd see in people who have um, a malarial infection because those infections do last quite a long time but pretty much any infectious process that makes you sick for um, weeks to months that's the kind of change where your body is going to start stripping minerals from the bone and it's going to cause this parotic hyperostosis especially on the inside of the eye orbital so if you're looking at an ancient person's skull and you look into the eye socket, if you see parotic hyperostosis inside the eye, that to us suggests that this person had a long-standing illness that uh, was severe enough to cause the body stress. So that's a good immediate stress marker. So the next thing we'd ask when we see this is, okay, did this person survive this illness or not? Well, we can tell this too from the bone. I think I've got this on the next slide. Let's see. Ah, yes. So you can recover from these episodes that cause bone changes because your, your bone heals. So if you come through this illness and your body recovers, then the bone is gonna start healing, especially as your nutrition improves and your bone starts building up its resources again. And that's where you get bones that look like this um, this skull we're looking at here. The surface nearest to us, you can see still the pores from the parotic hyperostosis, but they're smoothed over a bit. There's been some healing. Uh, however, this person is still dead and dead at a young age. If you look at the sutures, these are very clear sutures. This is somebody who's in their late teens, maybe early 20s. So gosh, this is somebody who could be one of you. Up at the top, we can see another case of healed damage. This one's really interesting because you can see bone darkening here and here. 
that's staining as part of the disease process. And you can also see the product hyperostosis here. And it's gnarly and bubbly and kind of extends down the surface of um, the humerus. This is a humerus. Likely what we're looking at here is a bone reaction associated with a long-standing soft tissue infection. So in the ancient world, when you don't have access to antibiotics, you can get a cut in your soft tissue. So like I say, I've got one like, you know, what surface are we on? So it's about here, where an infection develops underneath the surface of the skin. If it's open, then it becomes an ulcer. And then as time goes on, the infection is going to start attacking the bone tissue, which is going to cause this sort of bubbly reaction. So what this bone tells me is that somebody had a massive infected wound on this arm. But I also see smoothing in the tissue bubbling, which suggests to me that one way or another, this person managed to get better. I mean, more power to them. That's very impressive. But this is one thing to keep in mind. Before antibiotics, a scratch could end up with you having septicemia and dying, the uh, called Drogo route to the afterlife. Um, also, I can't think to the last time you cut yourself and imagine that you hadn't cleaned the wound properly. Think about what that wound may, might look like you know, how you would live your life with this, you know, pus draining out of your arm all the time. And then you get a sense of what it was like to be this person. It's um, difficult and it can make you cranky. Uh, Henry VIII had this problem with a, what was likely a varicose vein that developed into an open weeping ulcer and infection on his um, lower leg, so on the shin. It's a typical place where you see this kind of thing. Your shin is vulnerable. There's not much flesh between your shin bone and the surface of your skin, which makes it a really great place to get a bone infection, which is why one of the most frequently used armor items in the ancient world was the greave, because you really don't want to get a bone infection. Very uncomfortable. Do not recommend. I mentioned we can look for arthritis too, and you may notice on this, I think this is a femoral head. Yeah, that's femoral, or no, so. Nah, that's too small, that's somebody's fingers. This is, this is the head of the humerus, sorry. If you look on the surface of the joint, now in a living person, you'd have cartilage. I'm gonna use blue for the cartilage. Let's see if the highlighter works here. So the cartilage, Oh, that's a horrible highlighter. Let's try this again. Oh, no, that's really bad too. Anyway, pretend the green scribble is cartilage. So that would be padding the joint. And you can see that the bone there is nice and matte. It looks like bone. But if we look here, the light's reflecting off it. It's really smooth, it's polished. That happens when the cartilage is worn away and bone is scraping against bone every time this joint moves. And as that happens, the bone gets polished. Uh, this is a process called ebernation, which just means it looks like ivory because ivory is kind of shiny like enamel. So when we see ebernation, that's suggestive of osteoarthritis. That is arthritis that comes from bone rubbing on bone because the cartilage is worn down. You will notice, however, that these spines, we're looking at some next level stuff. The human spine isn't very good at being upright. Over time, the spine has a tendency to wear out its cartilage discs, like they, they try, Lord love them, but pressure carrying heavy loads, disease processes, and just like bouncing up and down. Like if you ride horses a lot, this process accelerates so much so that we can tell if somebody was in the cavalry by looking for lower back arthritic changes. So over time, 
as your discs degenerate and as your spine begins to rub against itself, the bone tries its best to stabilize the joint through a process called arthritic lipping. So what will happen is that on the edges of the bone that are touching each other here and here, the bone will grow in thickness to try to stop the wiggling from happening so much. And eventually that will fuse the vertebrae, like you see here, this poor person's spine. Um, this is likely a case of ankylizing spondylitis, which is, um, I'm pretty sure genetic disease might be autoimmune. I'm not remembering properly right now. Google it later. This is a disease process where your spinal arthritis accelerates drastically. So as this process continues, the bone spurs, because bone is kind of stupid, like it's just trying to heal. It's not trying to avoid the spinal cord and the spinal cord, do this in red. So the spinal cord is going through this space here. Where is my red pen? Why is it not working? Red pen, red pen. Here we go. Going through that space there. So as the lips protrude and spur, they poke into the spinal cord, they pinch it. They also pinch the nerve roots that are coming out of each of these little spaces here. There's supposed to be a nerve root coming out of it, but these lips will cut off the nerve roots and cause intense neuropathic pain. So you'll feel the pain like in your hands or in your feet or in your extremities. If it's in your very low back, you'll feel it in your genitals and it just depends where the damages on the spine is where you'll get the, the numbness, the tingling, the shooting electric pain. It's intense and unpleasant, and I'm sure some of you can attest. Today, we try to deal with this process by removing the bits of the spine that are poking into the space, by stabilizing the joints with artificial um, fusing. Sometimes we'll also put artificial discs in the spaces. We're getting a lot better at dealing with this. But spinal pain coming from arthritic changes and trauma is still a major modern problem. You likely know somebody who is in intense pain from a degenerating spine. And if you don't, someday you probably will. So this is something as future physicians that you might go out to trouble shoot and hopefully someday in the future nobody's spine needs to look anything like this i mean they don't now they just have surgery uh, another case here uh, this one's so bad that the lipping it almost looks like this is a spine candle that somebody has burnt halfway so this eventually will cause numbness paralysis extreme disability extreme pain so we're looking at two people, these spines aren't from the same person. Uh, both of these people were in intense pain with high levels of disability, but they lived for a long time, which means that somebody was likely looking after them and caring for them and loved them. So we're looking at somebody's dearly loved relatives, horribly diseased spine, and that's, that's just awful. Thank goodness for pain management, and gosh darn it, I hope we get better at this because it's it's a hard thing to see and a hard thing to live with. So next up, let's talk about something we have largely gotten the better of, and that is parasites. Now, we don't have a lot of soft tissue to study from the ancient world, uh, but as I mentioned at the outset, Egyptian mummies do give us an opportunity to look at some soft tissue. And now that we have MRI machines, we can look at them really, really well. And that's what we're looking at here, MRI images, um, and then also some tissue samples. So taking small samples of tissue from already damaged bits of mummies, we can test them for parasite load, isotopes and things. So there are respectful ways of figuring out what was going on with these folks. And these are pictures from such processes. So at the top, we have schistosomiasis, which is um, a worm that can get into the body, gets into your muscles, it can uh, block the drainage 
coming from your, your lymph nodes. If you're interested in this, um, this podcast will kill you recently had an episode on this. So if you like parasites, check them out. I love that podcast. Uh, Filariasis is another one. So these are another kind of roundworm that most of these um, are transmitted through water contaminated with fecal matter, both animal and human. The fecal oral route is one of the best ways to get a parasite if you want to go get yourself a parasite. And this, it doesn't happen because people are going out and eating poop, although some of your doctors are going to recommend exactly that. Uh, but instead, you don't wash your hands, you touch some something that somebody who hasn't washed their hands has touched, and their hands have little bits of poop on them. It doesn't take much poop to transmit disease in poop water. You know, your poop water gets into the well. Say you have a baby with cholera, and you throw the diaper into the cesspit that drains into the local water street pump, say. <clears throat> London, then that is one way that you can end up inadvertently drinking somebody's poop. What to do for that? There's alcohol. So mixing water with alcohol was one way to deal with some of the fecal contamination diseases that you could get from the water, but that doesn't do it for everything. And average ancient people had a very high parasite load. Um, but Dr. JL, you might object. We only have mummies from Egypt. Maybe Egypt was just parasite central. Ah, oh, I thought of that. And so have archeologists. One of the things we can do now with modern archeological analysis is to look at people's poop. That is, we dig in the bottom of latrines, we get a bunch of ancient poo, and then we take it to our lab and we see whose eggs are in it. And oh my goodness, so many eggs. Ancient people had a, um, if you will pardon the expression, crap ton of parasites floating around in their bodies, causing huge amounts of disease. Interestingly, there is a hypothesis uh, that the modern um, rise in people with allergies and autoimmune disorders might be related to the fact that we have bodies now that aren't carrying parasite loads, but our bodies haven't gotten the memo. So the thought is that our bodies are like vigilant and waiting to get attacked, but like we have vaccines now and we wash our hands, wash your hands. So our bodies looking for something to do start you know, attacking perfectly normal, innocuous things floating around our bodies, things like our own thyroids, for instance. And, you know, I, I am not a scientist. I can't evaluate that data. I find it really interesting, though, as a person who does have allergies. That's a thing. Uh, another hypothesis about this uh, specifically accounting for the higher incidence of autoimmune disorders in female-bodied people is that it might be, a, it might have something to do with um, the adjustments made to a female body to compensate for the existence of the placenta that um, Oh, I'm not explaining this well. Uh, Google placenta autoimmune and the internet will explain it better than I will. All of this is to say that the average ancient person had worms, lots and lots of worms. And you will notice this because ancient people are going to be coping with worms a lot in the text you're going to be reading. You're, you're just going to have an experience here. Um, also, we're gonna have to talk about poop a lot. It just comes with the territory here. This is kind of a poop and body fluids kind of class. One last parasite I want to make sure I get in here, down here, is a human lice. Now, 
humans are so tasty that not one but two species of lice have evolved specifically to hang out on our bodies in two different locations. We have head lice and pubic lice, and they are different. <laughs> of course. So ancient people are constantly dealing with lice and a lot of their uh, their grooming and their use of oil in their hair is a means to try to like keep the lice at bay a little bit but lice tick bed bugs vermin a lot of that happening in the ancient world and with it disease vectors so many disease vectors now you may ask at this point didn't any ancient people kind of realize that they were getting sick from some of this and the answer is it's complicated yeah especially with malaria they figured out that like swampiness has something to do with malaria and gold star there are even some ancient authors i think uh varro and perhaps vitruvius who suggest that little animals like tiny tiny animals might carry the malaria maybe so they are like almost there but without lab equipment like how do you prove that also if everybody has these diseases it's kind of hard to figure out the puzzle of how <laughs> It takes a really long time for the scientific method to tease out what is a basic population risk and what is a disease vector. And sometimes the two of them are the same. And then there's this constant battle between like, okay, you don't wanna get diseases, but also you might want to hug people eventually in your life. So how do we create a world where it's safe to hug people and we won't accidentally kill them? We're living in this moment right now where uh, every day we're contending with the tension between not wanting to kill people by spreading COVID and being super lonely. And that's, you know, that's the struggle. Saving human lives is not easy and it's not comfortable and there are trade-offs. And that negotiation of trade-offs is something that we're going to see ancient people beginning to tease out. Like, how much of your life are you willing to derail to take care of your health is something that we'll see ancient people go on with, especially when we get to diet and exercise and regimen and things. Like, ancient people, if they followed all of the health advice, they do nothing but health advice all day, every day. And some rich people didn't. Okay. So let's talk about pathology we can see on bones. Starting with an old friend, tuberculosis. This is one of the earliest diseases that we know jumped from animals to humans. And we start seeing it in Egyptian bodies very early on. This seems to be a disease of agriculture. So as soon as people start domesticating animals and living day to day with animals, breathing in the water droplets from animals, they start getting tuberculosis because you contract tuberculosis through breathing in water droplets most of the time, generally speaking. And animals can get it. People can get it. Another way you can get it, by the way, is if your cow or goat has tuberculosis and you drink their milk without pasteurizing it, you too can get tuberculosis, which is why you just make sure your cow doesn't have tuberculosis or pasteurize. Just do one of those things, please. Tuberculosis. Oh, what else? Do I oh, yes. Uh, the earliest tuberculosis patient we have ever found is a puppy. Little dog. Egyptian dog. Poor dog. And we still have him because his people loved him and mummified him. So, ooh. At any rate, so tuberculosis, because it travels in water droplets and it loves oxygen, it likes to hang out in the upper lobes of your lung. Your body also, um, if everything goes well, your body will recognize, ah, there's TB here. And mycobacterium tuberculosis is a slow moving disease for the most part, um, unless you get miliary tuberculosis, which is where you get a lot of tiny, tiny little lesions and they can like get into your bloodstream and then that kills you very quickly and that's quite bad. So do, do like get checked out for TB if you're worried. All right, um, hopefully miliary tuberculosis isn't something you'll have to deal with, but 
TB is still a major deadly disease that has antibiotic resistance problems, so still relevant information, just saying. Okay, so you breathe in the water droplets. It hits your lungs. The bacteria start to grow slowly inside the oxygen-rich, damp environment of your upper lung. Um, the combination of dampness and oxygen is tuberculosis is happy place. Then, if your immune system is strong, it's going to go in there and try to wall off the tuberculosis colony in a process called cavitation or encapsulation sometimes. So this forms a kind of rubbery ball around the tuberculosis colony called a tubercule, which just means a little potato, little, little tuber root, like little carrot little veg vegetable because that's what it looks like it looks like you've got you know veggies in your lung <laughs> evil tuberculosis veggies if you're super duper lucky then your body will encapsulate the tuberculosis and then the the tuberculosis pod the tubercule will slowly shrink and calcify and it'll just become this you know dead tuberculosis tomb that eventually your body will clear if you're super duper lucky. If you're medium lucky, the um, the nodule may remain, but the bacteria don't get out. The encapsulation has worked. That's a good case scenario. If you're unlucky, if your body can't get around the colony in time, or if the, the colony is very large, then the colony of tuberculosis bacteria will burst out of the encapsulation or grow faster than the encapsulation can grow. Also inside that tubercule you have dead tissue and bacteria kind of hanging out and the bacteria will keep eating the necrotic tissue inside and because it's in your lung your lung is full of airways so that bubble will burst and you'll end up having an empty cavity in your lung filled with this bacteria and rotting lung slime that as you cough you'll be coughing up droplets with the bacteria and the you know essentially like agar keeping it alive for somebody else to breathe in and catch which is how tuberculosis spreads you'll hear it called thesis or consumption sometimes in old-timey texts but that's that's tb um, so in advanced tuberculosis, you'll notice um, a foul breath coming from the lungs because you have these open cavities, this cavitation. And then as these cavities grow, they'll eat through the blood vessels of the lung. And because the lung is, well, the lung is essentially for your blood to get itself some oxygen, your lungs are full of these oxygen rich blood vessels. So as your body keeps trying to make this wall around the colony and the colony keeps like busting through and growing into the lung tissue, eventually it'll start eating into an area with a blood vessel, which is why you cough up blood and you can hemorrhage to death if it gets to a major blood vessel as part of that process. Like it can get to your pulmonary artery and you can die very quickly of a tubercular tubercular hemorrhage. And if you want to see that on film, may I suggest The Terror Season 1, if you liked doomed Arctic expeditions. The dog is doesn't die on screen, and that's kind of refreshing. Nor does the cat. It's a good feel-good movie. It's not a feel-good movie. It's People die a lot. Uh, and there's lead. All right, so back to the tuberculosis then. I'm not done, <laughs> there's more. Okay, so the tuberculosis loves your lung, but that's not the only place it's gonna go. Because it's eating into the area around your lung, it can also invade tissues next to your lung. In particular, the spine near where your lung is or the ribs around your lung area. And that's what we're looking at here. This is POTS disease or spinal tuberculosis. So what's happened is that a bit of a mycobacterium tuberculosis column, or colony rather, has colonized this 
area next to the spine, and then this person's body has tried to seal off that colony into a tubercule, but because the tissue it's hardening is spine, what it does is it weakens the spinal tissue, both because the bacteria is eating the bone, and then the body itself is trying to create a wall around the, the colony, and these walls are stupid. They don't realize they're next to a blood vessel or your spine. And so eventually, the area of the spine that's closest to the colony, this interior edge of the spine collapses, and then the outer part of the spine, this part, sticks out, and this creates a very easy to recognize hump. This fellow in an Egyptian tomb painting has a Pott's disease lump. So you can, it's in the high upper back near where the shoulder blades are, which is right up where the lung is. So that's spinal tuberculosis. That's pretty common. Um, we see it also in organs that can get into other bones. Basically, anywhere where your bloodstream flows, if some tuberculosis bacteria gets into that bloodstream, and it will because it's in your lung, can go there. Oh, another place that it tends to hang out are uh, the, the lymph nodes in your in your neck, and that's called scrofula, in case you ever wondered what scrofula is. Ancient people had a lot of it, and eventually there was a belief that if a king touched your scrofula lesion, then the king's touch could heal your scrofula. So a thing that uh, medieval and early modern kings had to do as part of their daily routine was to touch people's scrofula. So if you were a princess in the Middle Ages, you have to make sure that your princess scenario includes a block of time for scrofula touching. Princess pro tip. Okay, so that's how we can tell if we're looking at tuberculosis on a bone. Now let's talk about trauma. Trauma in bone, when we find it, it can be really helpful for figuring out what a person's life was like and what kind of care they had because bone can heal but it takes a long time to heal and you need other human beings to care about you in order to get that bone to heal to do your work to give you food you know all that good stuff and if a bone heals improperly this suggests that your community has failed you sometimes not necessarily but I am going to judge your community a little bit if you end up with a bone like this one. So this is an improperly healed radius where the bone wasn't set correctly. So the bone was broken here, and then instead of pulling it straight so it would set properly, they just kind of left it. And then bone, you know, its tissue is a little stupid. It, it just heals where it is in an attempt to stabilize the bone. So here, it's healed crooked. And what this is going to do is it's going to shorten one of your two forearm bones. So your wrist isn't going to work right. You're not going to be able to rotate your hand. So you're going to lose some dexterity and function in your hand because of this improperly healed injury. So yeah, I, I am judging this person's community because... Mm. At the top here, we've got an interesting case. So you'll notice that we have a depressed skull fracture. And you can see there's even a, a piece of bone that's been pushed down into the skull and no attempt has been made to lift that bone up. It's just been left. So it's really surprising to me that we also show signs of survival. This break isn't entirely sharp. If you look along this margin here, you can see how it's sort of rounded. It's a little smoothed. So this tissue had at least a couple of weeks to heal. So this person lived on for a few weeks with this bone stuck into their head. And, and it's a very sharp edge too. So this is likely an open skull fracture that's pierced the dura mater. So it should come as no surprise that we see some parotic hyperostosis and swelling 
you see here where the bone is raised and bulging and there are these fragments that have kind of fused together but also it's kind of bubbly and diseased looking like this whole swelling area so this person survived long enough to get a massive infection here and that's likely what killed them in the end uh, so what we have is somebody who most likely got bonked on the head either by another human or maybe it was an accident i'm not accusing anybody here but i, I sort of hope they never regained consciousness because this looks very unpleasant over here we have somebody that i'm not going to be so judgy about so here someone has had a fracture of uh the radius you can see here in the ulna there's also a little bulge that may suggest a break and then a reset but the ends aren't too messed up and if you look at this bone here it's kind of fused together but the lipping hasn't completely joined this is a complication that can happen even in the, the best treated break and this is a, a false joint essentially so the bone it couldn't quite fuse so instead it's kind of formed this unstable jointy thing and likely the instability rubbing against um the ulna here has caused this swelling reaction but this person lived their bone doesn't look too bad this could happen to anyone probably they used it a little bit too soon but maybe they had to go back to work like had less judgy still a little judgy but less judgy okay so let's talk about what you can do in the ancient world for somebody who has been smashed in the head here we have a procedure called trephination we'll talk about this more when we talk ancient surgery this is a procedure that we still do and this is one of the earliest surgical procedures that human beings ever came up with neanderthals were doing this so this is really old and also it's got a surprisingly high survival rate um the figure that i last saw for the mediterranean in the ancient world is that about 60 percent of the skulls who had this procedure performed on them show signs of healing and survival which is pretty darn good considering we are cutting holes in people's head so this could be done to a healthy person with uh, something like chronic headaches, possibly mental illness too. Uh, some cultures we know do this for psychiatric conditions. This is a horrible idea for psychiatric conditions, but for head trauma, this is not a bad idea because the problem with head trauma is not so much the break in the skull itself, but what happens in the brain in response to trauma. So the brain's kind of floating in cerebrospinal fluid inside your skull and when your skull takes a heavy blow your brain will slosh inside your skull and it'll smoosh up against the inside of the skull and this will cause a swelling and healing reaction as the brain swells it doesn't have any place to go because your skull is always there and it's kind of skulls are great until they're not so what to do in order to give that swelling brain tissue a place to go you can cut a hole in the skull and that'll create a space for bulging um, if you have a bleed between the skull surface and the lining of the brain cavity the dura mater is like this membrane that holds your brain and often you can get a bleed that's like right above your brain liner and below your skull so if you take the bone out of that area you can drain the bruising you can let that bleeds pressure out you can create some relief for a swelling brain and when the brain swelling goes down you can minimize the damage so still pretty risky but surprisingly survivable by ancient standards and there does seem to have been a lot of this going on so you would do this either with a small drill and these are examples of what these drills look like you'd use a twisted thong to operate the drill so it's a hand drill and you you know use that to um, drill out an area and then you'd pop it out like you rip a piece of perforated paper or you'd have 
a specialized saw with a modiolus, a, a little circular saw that you'd use to saw out the piece of skull. So let's look at some ancient people who underwent this procedure. Okay, so here I'm going to invite you again to pause this and to kind of scribble down what you think is going on with this person. Exactly. One. Okie dokie. So you'll notice there are these circular marks here primarily, but there's also one kind of like over here, very faint, and they have these little pin marks in the middle of them. And this not ha has not one, but two pin marks. And there are these chatter marks as well. So that pin you saw on the last slide in the middle of that circular modiolus saw, so the pin is removable. You use that in the first stages of cutting because if you've ever sawed wood, you've noticed this, where when you start sawing, your saw is going to like skip around a bit. It has to kind of bite in to get traction. So in order to keep your saw in place, there's this little pin in the middle so that you can kind of use the pin like a a stick pin and then you start sawing and that bites into the skull bone below and that once you've made this trench what you're next supposed to do is remove the pin because you don't want to pit the person in their brain tissue that's that's bad so you take out the pin and then you continue to saw very very carefully because you have to stop when you get to the bottom of the skull tissue and then you pop out that bit of bone. But but look here, we haven't gotten that far. Like we haven't made a complete circle. And our, our pin has hopped around a little bit. Not just that, but that the saw has chattered. And whoever was trying to do this gave up. You can also see there's some parotic hyperostosis on the surface of the skull too, which suggests that this patient was not doing great when this started. So I have two suggestions for what might be going on here. Either this person was having seizures as a result of a, a progressing brain infection or swelling or injury. And because they were moving around so much, the physician is having a really difficult time getting the saw in place and holding it there and getting in and that the patient likely died before the doctor had gotten very far into the procedure, so they just had to stop. The other possibility is that, and I think this is slightly less likely because again, this patient is pretty far gone, um, just judging from the pathological changes I'm seeing on the bone surface. So what we might have going on here is a newbie physician just going for it and not being very good yet at doing it. Or we could have some combination of this. Uh, what we might have is um, somebody's attending sees that the patient is probably not gonna do very well and they're like, hey, you know, Quintus, go give it a try. I really hope that's not the case for everybody's sake here because that would be horrible. But this is uh, one of my favorite bones straight up because it tells such an interesting story. And it gives us a really clear idea of what this person's last hours were like, maybe days, especially with the pathology on this bone. We can also look at the suture here, by the way. This is likely somebody who's um, in mid to late 20s, I'd say. So youngish person. It is unclear, by the way, this cut, uh, this might be perimortem, but we can't say for sure, for sure. That might be a sword blow, but it might also be a postmortem change. It's kind of hard to tell with perimortem injuries because the bone is still fresh, but doesn't have a chance to heal. However, it's an injury to the fresh bone itself because the edges are a little smoother, so the bone is still green. It's not dry. Dry bone cracks in a different way than living or recently dead bone because um, fresh bone still has um, connective tissue and soft, wet bits to it, so it's a little bit more bendy. But those soft, wet bits 
leach out with time and all you're left with are the hard calcium components and then uh, old dead bone shatters. Fun information. So here's some happy cases. Uh, this one is somebody who healed from not one but two trephination surgeries and lived to be quite elderly. I mean, I am seeing no sutures whatsoever. Uh, there does seem to have been some tooth loss in life, so you go. Nicely done. Over here, we have another case of a pretty well-heeled trephination. This is showing another technique, the scraping technique. Uh, if the drilling was a bit gnarly for you, this is going to be worse, and I'm so sorry. This kind of freaks me out a little bit, too. But this is one of the earliest kinds of trephination we see, where instead of drilling or sawing, instead they scrape. So you take um, a very sharp, sturdy knife, and then you scrape it over the surface of the bone and slowly layer by layer take off a bit by bit by bit until you're right down to that last layer of bone. This has the advantage of you can see what you're doing, you can go slowly, there's less of a chance of puncturing the dura mater because you're cutting horizontally across. But for the conscious patient, I don't care how stoned you are, that's not going to be a pleasant experience. On the other hand, as someone who experiences chronic migraines, I could see a world where if I thought that this would make me stop having a headache every day, I might sign up for it. I'm not lying there. I don't know, I'd have to be really high. Okay, so let's talk about dentistry. We're going to talk more about this in surgery week, but dentistry is important because your teeth can kill you because disease processes in the mouth it's just like any other part of the body when you have bacteria growing in a part of your body that bacteria can move the bacteria doesn't know that your dental insurance is completely different from your medical insurance and I make such a big deal about this because I know somebody who had a dental abscess that turned into brain abscesses. He had an untreated dental abscess. He couldn't afford to go to a dentist. And the abscess threw off what we call emboli. That's when bacteria from one infection travel through the bloodstream into another part of the body. In this case, it traveled through his blood vessels into the blood vessels serving his brain and then grew into these large bacterial colonies inside his skull and it took um, massive amounts of antibiotics to save his life and he almost did make it he's okay now though because antibiotics are the freaking best but as i mentioned you don't have as many cavities perhaps in the ancient world but you still do get them especially with upper class people who have a lot of soft foods. In lower class folks, you, you do get abscess processes too, but more from dental wear, from gritty, tough food, which eventually wears your teeth down until the, the pulp becomes exposed. And because the pulp is fresh, blood-rich tissue, it can develop infections. Um, your enamel, mm, not initially, no, kind of, because carriers. So, the acids and bacteria that live in your mouth, especially when they're fueled by sugar, which I should be telling myself more because I have way too many cavities. It's, um, yeah, I'm feeling a little judged by myself right now, which I guess is fair. At any rate, the uh, mixture of bacteria and acids will eat into your teeth, and that's what we're looking at here, dental caries or dental rot. And this eventually exposes your soft tissues in your mouth to bacteria, which will then infect the pulp inside your teeth and the soft tissues of your gums. And then anything that infects your soft tissue can eat into your bone as well because your bone is tissue too. So what ends up happening is a process very similar to what happens with tuberculosis. Your body will try to form a pocket around that pus or it will try to direct that pus into an area where it can drain out, which is what we've got going on here. So someone with a dental cavity here that's been left unfilled, that dental cavity has been infected 
um, as is the gum tissue, you can see where the, the bone at the base of the teeth has pulled away. So likely we have periodontitis too. So infection in the gums, infection in the tooth. All of this forms a pocket of infected pus and bacteria and tissue here that has started to eat its way out through the bone. And what this likely formed was a, a swelling on the face that eventually drained itself. So that's like the best case scenario is that the pus goes like not into your blood vessels in your brain, but out through your jaw. So A little spoiler for surgery week, the way people dealt with this uh, before reliable dentistry, they did try to fill cavities with various kinds of stuff. Uh, but essentially, all you could do was pull the tooth. But pulling the tooth is not a horrible response. What it does is it creates a place where the abscess can drain. So you remove the tooth, you clean the socket, and then you leave it open so the pus can drain out. And then once the infected tooth is removed and the pocket has been cleaned, hopefully your body will be able to take over and heal that area. So, you know, it's better than pus in your brain. Most things are. So a little bit more good news. We do get prosthesis in antiquity. Not a ton and the evidence is super sketchy, but we do get people who survive losing limbs under various circumstances. And we do have things that are suggestive of folks wearing prosthesis. So we'll look at a few ambiguous examples. I'm gonna start with the dentistry because we just had some dental horror. So let's give ourselves something to feel good about, shall we? This is an Etruscan dental bridge. Now, not all dentistry is made to be used on living people. Sometimes uh, teeth would be filled in in bodies that were being kind of made whole for the afterlife. However, in this case, there are um, plaque patterns around the gold wires of the bridge that suggest pretty convincingly that this was a dental bridge somebody wore in life. And it's got two um, human teeth that have been put in here on the bottom so that when this person smiled, you'd at least see like a couple of teeth there. And likely their two front teeth were lost either due to trauma, there does seem to be a good divot taken out of this jaw, but that could also happen as part of a disease process. And if you look at the bone, it's looking a little puffy down in here. So um, if I were betting on this, I'd say disease process rather than trauma, but a lot of people are getting punched in the face in antiquity, so it could be trauma or both. Next up, a little bit more ambiguous. This is coming off an Egyptian mummy. And as I mentioned, Egyptian mummies were made to be as complete as possible. And if a body part was missing, that body part would often be replaced so that the body would be complete in the afterlife. And there's some mythological reasons for this. Uh, according to legend, the first mummy was the god Osiris, and he was murdered by his brother. And then Isis found all of his chopped up dismembered body parts, put them back together, and made Osiris, except like she couldn't find one bit, and that was his penis. So she made an ivory one, and that was good enough. Good job, Isis. So what we have here is someone with a missing toe and this artificial toe connected by these um, leather plates held on by sinews. Now, it is possible that this was post-mortem because in the mummification process, extremities had a tendency to drop off and uh, toes are an extremity and the big toe is a largish one, so it could happen. Uh, however, this is a lot of prosthesis for just a body. And the way that it's designed with these plates that flex and bend, and the fact that it's a big toe, you need your toes to balance, and your big toe is especially important. Um, I once injured mine in an unfortunate karate accident, and a year of limping around with a messed up big toe before I had surgery to correct it uh, convinced me that it is very difficult to walk without your big toe. Uh, quite uncomfortable. Um, at tr and try this at home. 
stand up and kind of pick your big toe up off the floor and then try to balance and then try to walk around a little bit and you can see the shape of the problem. So if this was a prosthesis used in life, and I think there is a good chance this might very well be, because it's got these springy elements to it and it's replacing a joint where if you had something tied to the front of your foot, it would help you to balance. You could at least push off of your fake big toe and it would give you a quality of life boost. So I'm gonna give this an 80% likelihood maybe of being real prosthesis. I'll take it. Now over here, you'll notice this is not a prosthesis, but what this is, is somebody's femur. So here's the femur. And you'll notice at the bottom, the femur ends about halfway down and there's bone remodeling, including this bone spur here. Bone spurs happen when there's pressure on the bone. We saw this in the spines, right? When a spine is collapsing downward, the, the bone reacts by growing out in little splooshes from the side. So what we might have here is somebody who either had their leg amputated or had an accident that caused uh, the limb to wither and drop off at the mid midpoint. Um, likely though, we're, we're probably looking at ephemeral amputation, which is super surprising because you can't just chop off a femur. The femur, because it's a very big bone, big chonky bone, it has a lot of marrow and in the center of it and a, a lot of blood in that marrow. And it's also a part of the limb that's next to the femoral artery. So if you're amputating, you need to be able to control some intense bleeding and you also need to be able to work really really quickly so that your patient doesn't go into shock so this is a tricky amputation however we do know of one ancient doctor i, I think the name is anaxagoras but i might be misremembering this um we don't have his writings we have him quoted at another later doctor who apparently like used cold water compresses to smush the limb right before amputating almost like a tourniquet, but not quite. Um, part of the problem was they hadn't figured out how circulation worked yet, and that made controlling bleeding difficult. More about that in surgery. So what more often happened was you'd have an injury that would cause uh, the blood supply to be crushed, to be limited. The part of the limb that was no longer receiving blood would wither and die. And if you were lucky and there wasn't gangrene, um, it'll naturally get dry and then drop off and then a physician could go in and revise the end of that limb loss to be more comfortable but in that case bleeding is less of a scenario you're thinking about because you've already limited the amount of blood going to that area so at any rate long story short somebody lost half a femur but the fact that there's enough pressure on this stump to create this kind of pointy shape and this bone spurring suggests that this person may have had some kind of a leg prosthetic to help them walk. If so, that's super neat. So I will end this increasingly long lecture with a good news story, because I think at this point we could use some good news. Haha, <laughs> look at this. It's sixth century CE Italy, so it's a little late for us, but hey, we need a win. So this is a prosthetic that was found on a skeleton from sixth century CE Italy, and you can see bits of it here. It was an iron knife, which is what this is here, and then there was a buckle holding it on to this fellow's lower arm. Um, this is a a male-bodied skeleton. You can tell from the, the sharp angle of the pelvis, tucked in coccyx, um, a strong-ish ridging on the skull. So if I had to guess male, um, but without DNA you can't be sure and that just tells the sex, but nonetheless this probably dude has what's essentially like a machete attached to his arm. <laughs> 
which I just love. Isn't that funny? Uh, now, I bring this up, even though it's very late, because there are written descriptions of people in the ancient world who did have this kind of prosthetic. So let me tell you about Marcus Sergius. Marcus Sergius was a particularly badass Roman, and that's a culture that produced quite a number of badasses. So he made Pliny the Elder's list of four top most badass Romans. So good on him. Why, you may ask? Well, He'd been in so many engagements that he had the maximum number of wounds that any Roman had been recorded having, and they were all on his front, which was a point of pride. Um, he also had one hand that had been injured so badly that he, he couldn't really flex it or use it. And then he was missing his other hand. I think, it, I think it was his right hand he was missing. So he had a prosthetic hand made, and then he kept going to war like he had horses killed out from under him i think he also had like a a leg injury so he he couldn't fight on foot so he always fought on a horse and he just kind of kept going into battle and apparently when he was a praetor which is a high public official in the roman government he it, other people in the government tried to keep him from being invited to a public sacrifice because of ancient ableist policies. So ancient people thought that it wasn't appropriate for anybody who wasn't perfect in body to go make sacrifices to certain gods. They felt that the gods required a whole body in order to be properly respected. And Marcus Sergius took them to court. And that's why we know about all this stuff about his prosthetics and such is that he he went to court and made a speech arguing that he deserved to be able to pray to the gods just like everybody else in his position. Like the other praetors got to sacrifice, he wants to sacrifice too. And he said, okay, look, I will challenge any of you guys to fight me, fight me bros. And if, you know, I, I know I can beat your asses with my body, even though it's missing parts. So how dare you call me imperfect and unable to go sacrifice to the gods, which makes him, I, I'm not sure I'd like to hang out with him actually. I feel like he would get into a fight at the restaurant with the waiter and it would be very embarrassing. But on the other hand, this is a really important moment in disability history. This is somebody who was discriminated against for not having a perfect body and who took people to court and won the right to sacrifice to the gods. And that is pretty darn nifty. And that's also something to keep in mind. It's kind of a grim landscape out there. We're going to see people um, in pretty gruesome conditions having the worst days of their lives. But within this landscape of suffering and death and desperation, there are people who, not even are people as if it's minority, there's joy and beauty and uh, inclusiveness too. And there are people who continue to live their lives in bodies that are not behaving for them very well. And that to me is great, is someone who's chronically ill when I see other people fighting to be included in the ancient world, I'm like, yeah, it, it's it's just, you know, nice to find your people, except Sergius definitely wouldn't take him to a bar. Okay, on that note, I leave you. I hope this was interesting. I hope I have not scarred any of you too badly. And I will see you for our next unit in which we will delve deeper into the mechanics of Hippocratic clinicians. Peace out.